Welcome to the rendezvous. Welcome, 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 everyone. We're so glad that you joined us tonight. Why don't you get up on your feet? If you're watching online, come on and join us. Stand up on your feet as well. Come on.
Father God, we thank you for your fire, God, that it never runs out, Father God. Father God, we thank you for this night that you have ordained, Father God. Father God, we ask that your fire will just continue on and on and on forever, Father God. You are eternal, Father God. Father God, we ask that your fire will consume us whole, Father God, and never let us go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Welcome to the rendezvous. Come on, lift it up. We are so glad to have you here tonight. So right now we're going to go into a time of FaceTime. So turn to your left, turn to your right, and say hi to somebody, y'all. Come on. make it today to join us here for the best night of the week especially with that rain we had earlier seriously yeah that, that was, was wild. that was crazy well anyways my name is jason and here i have the amazing pastor crystal joining <laughs> me for announcements and uh we just want to start off by welcoming our vip guests so if it's your first time here with us at the rendezvous we consider you to be our vip yeah. guests and we love you we love you so if you would watch this watch this ready boom oh. We have a connect card on your seat. I know, right? That was cool. That was cool. Uh, so there's a connect card on your seat. If you can fill that out for us, we just want to get you better connected here at the rendezvous. Yeah. Just, you know, connect with you, like I said. Um, but anyways, uh, there are plenty of other ways that we like to connect here at the rendezvous. What's another one? Yes, another one we, like we have something called the Hype. The Hype, yes, they meet every single week at seven o'clock right here in this room and it's really just a leadership moment to gather together we do just that we get hype for the service we get encouraged by a word and we just get ready to set the tone for the rest of the service so if you're in this room even if you're watching online you are invited to the hype next week seven o'clock right here in this room yes yes amazing we love the hype but also we have something to get hype for next saturday august 6th we have our back to school Woo! serve day guys listen we have a school we have tca and we're gonna be cleaning it up we're gonna yeah. be making it nice and clean and neat for our uh back to school for our kids so we just want all hands on deck. If you guys feel led to, please come. I want to encourage you yes. to please come help out. And if you need a little more encouraging, there's going to be two meals, not just breakfast, 
but also free lunch. So I mean, it's I mean, come on guys, you it's can't go deal. wrong with free breakfast and free lunch. I mean. I love that, so yes. I'll, I'll be there for sure. Absolutely, that is two out of three meals that you have in the day that we're gonna cover, but really we just wanna serve our school, our teachers, and we want you to be a part of it. You can sign up for Serve Day by texting Serve Day to 66866. And we're gonna transition in another part of our service, another part of worship, which is through our giving. Generosity is our privilege here at The Rendezvous, and there's a few ways that you can give there's an envelope on your seat that you can fill out, put cash, you can even fill out your card information on there and drop it in the bucket as it passes by. But the easiest and quickest way to give, especially if you're watching online, is by text. You can text Trinity Miami to 77977 and give through the link. But tonight, Jason is going to encourage us. Yes, and tonight I'm going to be reading from Proverbs 3, verse 9 and 10, and it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. So, offering, really, what is that? When I was growing up in the church, I grew up in the church. I was yeah. a church kid. And really, I understood already the concept of God, that, you know, God loves us, God created us, He provided everything, but I didn't really understand the concept behind offering I was like okay I get this money I don't really have that much money my mom is giving me money to give to the church and I'm like well this isn't even really my money yeah. when she was first giving it to me but I would just do it out of obedience because um, she told me to so then um, as I was getting older I would realize that really where did this money come from really the reason why we have anything is because yeah. God provided it to yeah. us. And really, that's just us being faithful to him because right. he was faithful first. Right. And uh, I think it's really important that we have a gesture, a, a heart posture that is grateful that we can even yeah. give. You okay. know, that, that we even have the means of giving. Because it, it, in those times, that's when God really sees our heart. He doesn't yeah. care about our money. God, I mean... God created everything that yeah. we see around us, but he really cares about our hearts. So I just want to encourage you guys tonight to have a heart posture that uh, as we give, that God, I want to honor you with this offering. Yeah. God, this is for you because you were faithful to me first. Yeah. So let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, because we can give you offering. We can, we can give back to you, God, because you gave to us first. We pray that our heart posture honors you, God, as we as we give our offering. And that you may uh, bless your children and continue to keep us um, in your hand, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Join us as we continue in our time of worship. Pray. 
of God is available to us right here and right now. Well, hey, I'm excited uh, to preach tonight, but uh, the, today's a special day, and uh, it happens that it, it lands on a Tuesday. I guess it, what, once every seven years? Is that how that works, that it lands on a particular day? But uh, July 26, 2019, Crystal and I got married today, this Tuesday. And so, uh, hey, Mark, can you just stand next to baby just for a second? Crystal, can you just come up here just for a moment? Of course, this is going to be the time when Oliver goes rogue, you know, so we'll see. Uh, so pray for him just for these few seconds. But Crystal, um, I just want to take a moment to honor you. And I think for, um, you know, there's a lot of sayings going into marriage about what it's going to be like and what it's not. And there's all these ideas about what it's going to be. And one of the things that my dad told me growing into marriage was that marriage magnifies who you are. And it either magnifies the negative things and also magnifies the positive things. And I want to let you know, Crystal, that being married to you for these three years has made me a better man. And it's made the ministry better. It's made the people around me better. Why? 
because it's magnified the things that I know I need to work on, the things that maybe as a single man I was able to hide. But now that we're together a lot, I can't hide those things. So it's made me, those have been exposed and made me a better man because of it. On the other side, it's made me sharper in the positive qualities of me. It's made them better because I have you behind the scenes continually encouraging me, lifting me up. And man, there's so many times I'm able to just tell Crystal, man, I just don't feel like, man, it's, it's hard. It's what this. And Crystal's been the voice besides Jesus, of course. Crystal has been led by the Holy Spirit so many times. Sometimes I can just listen to her and say, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's God saying to you? And every time it's just an on-time word. And I want to thank you so much for what you've meant to me. And I really think that rendezvous has been blessed because you decided to say yes to me. So even if that means you've survived three years with me, I'm super thankful. And uh, so can we just give it up for Crystal and for us? I love you so much, Crystal. You're amazing. Well, why don't you take a moment, smile to someone next to you. If this is your opportunity to give them a breath mint, uh, you totally can. Uh, ideally, the cinnamon kind is really strong. It's not super a favored. Ice breakers, Listerine strips, whatever you need. Um, either that, you know, maybe you can just face me and then the breath doesn't go. I guess maybe be towards the person behind you. But either way, uh, I'm excited to be with you today. Uh, today, we're going to be reading uh, from Matthew chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew is the very first book of the New Testament. There are two Testaments in the Bible. There is the Old Testament and there is the New Testament. And the, New Test the Old Testament is before Jesus. The New Testament is with Jesus. So this is kind of cool because Jesus is talking right here in Matthew chapter 14. If you don't have your Bibles, they just come up right up on the screens. But it says this. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Now, for some of us, if you don't think you need to pray, the Son of God, Jesus, he needed to get away to pray. So I think it's important that we pray as well. He said, later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, casually saying that, you know, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, I don't know if it's you, but if it is, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The title of my message tonight is Lessons from a Storm. Lessons from a Storm. God, we thank you tonight for who you are. Would you speak through me, God? Would you use me? May hearts be open to what you have to say. May we leave a little bit differently than when we came in. And it's your name we pray. And everybody said, and everybody said, come on, can we give Jesus one more shout of praise in this place? Have you ever, like, wondered, like, is God really with you? Have you wondered that? I know some of us, they're super spiritual, more spiritual than me, and have never wondered if God was really with them. Like, I, I guess I know that you're with me right now, right? I know that I am on this stage. I know that it rained earlier today. I know that the Miami Heat are going to win the championship next year. Like, there are certain things. I'm just kidding, just kidding. We don't know. Maybe. We hope. There are certain things that I feel like are tangible that I could see with my eyes. But how do I know if God is the one that's really with me? Because we've learned about it. We hear about it. There might be moments we felt it like there was something there. But how can we really know if God is with us? 
Is it just our minds playing tricks on us that when we pray and focus on it, that it's just a matter of meditation? That it's just a matter of the way our mind, you know, really all we need is our mind because our mind's got a lot of power. DJ, you talked about that the last series. Is it just the fact that, you know what, the music is playing and sometimes I feel like maybe the bass hit really hard and that was the Holy Spirit, but maybe it's not. Have you ever wondered if God was really with you? And I think that there is a misconception about God that says depending on the season of my life determines how much God is working in mine. It's almost as if when my life is going my way, then there's perception is, well, man, God must have decided like I'm okay and that he's decided to finally put favor on my life and answer all the prayers that I really desired. That God finally sees how much I've been doing for him. Man, I, I'm highly blessed, highly favored. How you doing today? Can't complain. God is good. But what if I told you today that even though it might not seem like God is sometimes with you, that God can send you into a storm? Maybe God can send you into a storm. Matthew, this is verse 22 of Matthew. It says, immediately, this is after the disciples, they just, Jesus has fed the 5,000. It says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. So again, this after he's fed 5,000 people, he wanted his disciples to go on ahead so Jesus could have time to pray to himself. He made the, disciple, he made the disciples go ahead of him to the other side. They went on a journey going where Jesus had told them to go. And all he said was, you'll get to the other side. That's all he told them. How many of us have told, how many of us have done what God has told us to and all we did was hold on to his word? All we did, we didn't know what it was going to look like. We didn't know what it was going to sound like. He didn't tell us what the journey was going to be. He didn't tell us the obstacles that we would face. He just said, you're going to make it. He just said, you're going to make it to the other side. All he said was, don't worry, it's going to be okay. But there's sometimes God just tells us it's going to be fine, but he doesn't tell us what it's going to look like on our journey to get there. And how many of you today just need a word that you're just going to make it through this season of life? Sometimes that's all we need. Even if that's all I had to hold on to, like that would be enough. That's what Pastor Rich talked about this past Sunday at the end. He's just like, some of you just need a hug and just for someone to tell you, hey, it's going to be okay. Hey, you're going to make it. But after he had dismissed them, this is verse 23 and 24, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. If you notice, he went up on a mountainside so that he, yes, he went up there to pray, but because Jesus is on a mountainside elevated from the level of the water, he could always have his eye on the boat. That there wasn't one moment when Jesus was, did not have his eye and know what was going on with the disciples. That God has his eyes on you. It may seem like he's far. It may seem like there's some times when God's not really there. It may seem like, God, you have left me. You have forsaken me. But I want to tell you today that even though you may feel like that, God has never left you. He's never left you. He is always close. He always knows what's going on. In fact, he knows more about you and your situation than you do. Why? Because he knows what's on the other side. And today, I want to talk, talk about the faith you need while in the storm. Because what we have here is a storm that the disciples were sent into where Jesus knew it was going to happen. 
And this wasn't like a Jonah storm, you know? Like Jonah faced the storm because Jonah was disobedient. God told him to go one way. He went the complete opposite, so there was a storm that was sent. So if you're facing something difficult today because of a direct result of your action, number one, I believe that God is with you. But today I'm talking about the storms where we genuinely don't feel like we deserve them. The storms where you say, I feel like I've been doing everything right. I'm doing the things God tells me to. Why is this happening to me? Why? Why me? Because here's what we know so far. Jesus sends his disciples into a storm. And Jesus is keeping his eyes on them as he prays. So I believe there are a few faith lessons that we can learn from the storm. Are you ready? Some of you are concerned. Like, DJ, you haven't cracked the joke yet. It's okay. Number one, faith is needed when fear is present. Faith is needed when fear is present. Verses 25 through 27 says, Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Again, casually walking on the lake. I love that. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. They cried out in fear, but Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Often, fear is a trigger for our need for faith. Often, fear is a trigger for our need for faith. The disciples are on the Sea of Galilee known for its occasional storms. And this version of the Bible says that it was just before dawn. Another version of the Bible says it was on the fourth watch, which I kind of like that version more, the fourth watch. Because back in those times, while the crew would go to rest at night, they would break up the watches kind of like in quarters. So it's like a basketball or a football game where you have four quarters. There's the first watch, second watch, third watch, and fourth watch. And so this one was the fourth watch, which means that it had been all night when they, when they were facing this storm. At this point, they've been facing winds all the way through the night. This is about three in the morning when Jesus comes. But they had been facing wind that was against them for about four to five miles. And you're not talking about boats with, like, you know, propellers that can go really fast, got a, a you know, insane amount of horsepower. You're talking about boats that literally just depend on the wind. And at this point, they were a, the Bible says that they were a considerable distance from Jesus. Have you ever felt like you were in a storm of life that was longer than expected? You know what I'm saying? Like it starts and you're kind of like, <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Got that bad news, that bad report. I can do this. All right, let's go. Let's keep the smile on. And day one and two and three aren't too bad, you know. And it's, it's like, okay, God, what are you doing here? And then it's four days and five days. And okay, God, um, what's, uh, what's happening next? And then eventually it's like a whole week, two weeks, a month, and now you're just on the floor crying. You're like, why is this happening to me? I thought it was going to be one thing, but it's something completely different. I thought it was kind of funny. I thought that it had a strength initially, but now I'm getting kind of worried. Like, this is serious. This went from like a, a, a doctor's report all the way to a surgery. I didn't expect that. This went from a short, uh, di a short disagreement to now we're thinking about separating. Wait, what happened? Where did this go? I didn't expect it to get this bad. So they're facing a storm. They've been there since 3 in the morning. And then Jesus decides to walk on the lake. Now, I find this interesting because first off, what an incredible move, okay? Like, I think that these are the kinds of things that if I'm the savior of the universe, these are the kinds of things that I'm doing. You know what I'm talking about? I'm walking on water. I'm flying. I'm snapping my fingers and having things like appear. I don't know what I'm doing. Let's just be thankful that I'm not your savior, okay? I'm like showing off. I mean, even magicians have tried to replicate this using technology 
to mimic as if they're actually walking on water. Hey, well, Jesus was the one who did it first, and he did it clean. No technology. This is straight up walking on water. But out of every time that Jesus would decide to walk on water, why does he decide to do it in the middle of the storm? Like, let's face it. That's not what the disciples wanted. Like, the walking on water stuff, like, if this is me, okay? I know you asked for my opinion tonight. If I'm walking on water, this is when I'm teaching the 5,000 people. I'm saying, here's the bread. Listen, there's only this boy with these two loaves and, or two fish and five loaves. Here's 5,000. Let me tell you, I'm the son of God. Watch this. You know, and you start backing up and you're walking on water and everyone's like, whoa, that's amazing. Like, this is when God, that's when Jesus should show his power, don't you think? Why would he show his power in the storm? It's like, there's another story in the Bible where this paralytic man comes down from a ceiling and obviously he's looking for healing, but the first thing he says is your sins are forgiven. And you're like, okay, cool. Why are you doing the one thing? I asked for one thing, but God, you're doing another. Like, shouldn't he be saying, like, hey, shouldn't God just be saying, like, listen, hey, yo, cool, I can walk on water, check out all these things I can do, but listen, this is not a time to do this, okay? We are in the middle of the storm, Jesus. I know you're trying to do something here, but that's not what I want you to do. Why are we doing this? I wanted one thing, but God, you're doing something else because the reality is, initially, he doesn't stop the wind. Well, he could. He can't, and his, his very voice he spoke that sea into existence, right? He spoke the sea into existence. The word, the word was with God. The word was God. Jesus is the word. The word that spoke that water into existence is now walking into the storm. Wouldn't the first question you'd be asking is, God, would you please just take the storm away? Can my family just stop arguing for once? God, th these bills are piling up. God, can you just take a few of them away? God, I'm, I'm experiencing an overwhelming amount of work. I am overwhelmed. Will you just take it away? God, can this lottery ticket could this be the one? Because he doesn't stop the wind. He didn't stop the storm. The wind, the wind didn't stop just because the word showed up. Just because God was there didn't mean the storm stopped. Now, the disciples were most likely afraid because if you see a figure a ghost out in the water in the middle of a storm, you're probably thinking this is some demon, you know, or some devil that's out there. Because how many of us, if we're seeing some creepy figure when we're in a really hard season of our life, we're going to think that that's the enemy trying to work. Why? They're so afraid. They're like, that's a ghost. Jesus, I rebuke you. They didn't really know how to say that yet because Jesus is in front of them. But they're like, whatever power is here, ah! It just said they cried out in fear. Like, what else are you going to do? But my question is, is why does he show himself in the storm? Why does Jesus show himself in the middle of the storm instead of using his power to take away the storm? And I think it's Jesus is trying to show us that the intensity of the storm does not dictate the intensity of God's presence. That the storm in your life does not dictate how close you are with God. It doesn't dictate if he, how much he loves you. In fact, the Bible says that there is nothing on this earth that can separate you from the love of God. So some of us think that our season of life and whether or not is hard or not is dependent on the love that God has for us. When in reality, this passage is showing us that God could literally be 
that he could see you. He could be in front of you in the middle of the storm. God is with you, period. It's not God is with you when you do get the job, when everything is going right. It's just God's with you, period. Peter says this, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. I love how Peter automatically is asking God for a command. Listen, God, if this is you, tell me to come. He's not saying take away the winds or the waves. He's just saying, tell me to come. And Jesus said, come. I think that some of us, like if we literally took any sermon that we've ever heard in our entire lives and actually fully grasp it and live it out, it'd probably change our lives forever. I mean, a lot of us in this room have heard a lot of sermons. But what if all you did was any time that you were facing something hard, You just obeyed the command that Jesus says, come. Let's forget about all the other stuff. There's a lot of rules, regulations. God, you're trying to do this, 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 this. Well, what if? Come. The Bible says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What if you just followed that one? Sometimes we get so caught up with the 37 things that we're not good at or we feel like we need to improve. Let's just try one of them. Jesus just says, listen, there's a storm right now. I want you to come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. I love how casual scripture is. I mean, if I'm writing this, I'm putting exclamation points. I'm dancing. I'm saying, and the disciples were hype, bro. They were freaking out, you know, like what's going on? What are the other disciples thinking? But what we want to do is we want to pray the storm away because of what the storm is causing in me. Because it's not the storm. It's not the storm. It's the fear. It's the worry. It's the anxiety. It's the what ifs that come with the storm. Because if I'm not tripping at the storm, I'm like, I got nothing to worry about. But you th- your mind takes you to places that causes you to feel these certain types of ways. So God is speaking to us saying that he can use storms to sharpen our faith. So now when I am afraid, when I have fear that overwhelms me, it is an indication that I need to step out in faith. That's the indication. When your stomach growls and you're looking for some Chipotle, what do you do? You get some Chipotle. That when your mouth is dry, it's a sign you need water. Well, in the same way, if you feel afraid, that's a time that your body, that your spirit is calling out to say, this is where I need to take a step of faith. This is where I need to step out. Now, what does this mean? First, it means to follow the word that God gave you. If he just said, come, maybe that's the word that God gave you is to do it. And second, Peter calls out and is like, Jesus, tell me to come. And Jesus simply says, come. The first step is always to go to Jesus, but there are often distractions that keep us from going to Jesus. And that's why the second thing is that faith is determined by focus. Faith is determined by focus. Verse 30 says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, beginning to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You can't control the storm But you can control your focus. You can't control the storm, but you can control your focus. When I first started driving, my dad used to always tell me, son, keep your eyes on the road. And you know what happened? The first time I decided to not put my eyes on the road, I got into a car accident. Has anyone ever been in a car accident before? It is the most unsettling experience that you can have. Your car that once drove 
no longer drives. And it is a trippy, it is a crazy experience. I hope that you never have to go through it. Now, I'd sometimes there are cases when someone else is at fault. This one was me because literally I'm driving, I look away, I come back, and I rear-ended the person that was in front of me. Peter, he started strong. He started strong. This is like the first two or three days of that storm that you know you're kind of going into, that you feel pretty good. You're still reading your Bible. You're still praying. You're still looking to God. He started strong step by step, but he ended up losing focus and drowning. The only thing that would have kept him from drowning was just his loss of focus, which means that we play a bigger role than we think that we do. I like to picture this whole scenario. Like, let's make the Bible a little bit more fun, okay? Can we do that just for a moment? What if this was a boxing match, okay? And you know how, like, they announce the boxes as they come out? You have two opponents, you have in the right corner, you have the wind. The wind is magnificent. You cannot see it. It's hard to face. It's grand. It can shake the trees. It can shake the ocean. It can make waves that are bigger than anything that you've ever seen in your entire life. You should be afraid. And here we have the wind. There's one corner, right? Oh, man, who's going to face the wind? That's a pretty big deal, bro. I can't even see the wind. I can't even touch the wind. How am I supposed to even fight the wind? I'm like, what do you do? Punch it? Like, what do I do? But in the other corner, standing at six foot two, picture that that's how tall, I don't know. Standing at six foot two, the creator of the entire universe. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. In fact, he was the one who spoke the wind into existence in this corner. We have the son of God, Jesus Christ. I mean, that would be hype, bro. That would be hype. You got this boxing match. You're watching it. You're like, what? When you, when you make it sound like that, the storm seems pretty big, but Jesus seems like he's a bigger deal than the storm. And the, the, the determining factor of who wins in your life is who gets the most airtime. Think about that. Who gets the most airtime in your life when a storm hits? Oh, man, it's happened again. My life is terrible can't believe it. She said that to me again. My boss did this. He did that. Well, where's your focus? What are you looking at? Because your focus is on the storm, the season of life, the storm's going to win. The only thing that you have to do is keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's bring this to real life. God is telling me to walk out in faith. God is telling me to act the same that I do in church as I do when I'm at work or at school. God is telling me that there are words coming out of my mouth I should not say. God is telling me to give. God is telling me to walk out and pray for that person I've been praying for. God is telling me to leave this job and step out in faith in this other scenario. It could be something small or it could be something big. But Jesus is in front of you. Now the winds are fear, they're anxiety, they are the what ifs. So you're trying to focus straight ahead and fear is coming at you right here. And the what ifs are coming at you here. And your family is talking over you, they're coming right here. So literally, you are getting crossed and punched both ways. And if you keep your eye on Jesus, that's going to happen. We make it seem like P Peter is this loser dude. Who, man, if I was there... I would have focused on Jesus. No, you wouldn't have. This is a storm. You're in a hurricane. You're still trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is. You just met him like a few days ago, maybe a few weeks ago. So you're trying to look, and you're walking on flipping water. Like, what is going on? This is a crazy situation. You're walking out in faith. You're walking out in faith. You're you're walking on water. You know what it means to walk on water? Literally, 
walking on water means. The only reason that I'm making this step, the only reason that I'm here right now, the only reason that I have joy right now, the only reason I have peace right now, the only reason that I'm okay right now, the only reason I haven't fell apart is not anything by my might or by my power or by my strength, but it's because I put all of my weight on my Savior, Jesus Christ, and if he were to let me go, I'm falling straight through the water. I got to fix my eyes on Jesus. I got to keep my eyes focused or I'm falling through. It's as simple as that. You want to wonder about your faith? Keep your eyes fixed on him and see what your faith can do. See what it can do. We need to understand that even though there is danger, even though there is worry, there is a greater help in Jesus Christ. Lastly is this. I, this is the key. If you're not going to remember anything else, it's this is that your faith is dependent on you using it. Your faith is dependent on you using it. Verse 32 says, When they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him. Listen to this. They worshipped him saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I now know. I was wondering... If God, you were really with me. I was wondering if all those things I've been seeing and hearing and experiencing about God were true. But through this experience, I'm now determining, I know for a fact now that you are the Son of God. And the reality is, you don't need much faith. The Bible says, the size of your faith just needs to be a mustard seed. And I know Jesus said, Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? If I'm Peter, I'm like, yo, my little, my little faith, I walked on water. <laughs> I took a few steps on the water, Jesus. Like, I know I'm not there yet. And I know I do doubt sometimes. And God, I don't have full confidence in you. And God, it's really hard because my mind is constantly overthinking. I'm constantly playing through the scenarios, but there was this one time. <laughs> there was this one time I stepped out, and God, you did something amazing. I walked on water. It was unbelievable. And God's like, but you stopped. <laughs> what happened? You know what's interesting? That they would decide at this point in time, that they decided, the disciples who were followers of Jesus, they got to walk side by side with God's son. This chronologically was the 19th miracle of Jesus. The 19th. Most of them they had seen with their very own eyes. He's healed a blind man. He's raised someone to life. He's called another storm. He healed the paralytic man who was brought through the roof. He did a miracle with the fish where they, they, he says, cast your nets on the other side. He says, we haven't caught anything. Throws it to the other side. They got to experience this. Turn water into wine. He had performed 18 previous miracles. And they finally realized that this was the son of God. How many things... Does God need to do in your life for you to finally decide that you're going to put your faith in him? How many things? But you want to know the difference between the first 18 and the 19th? It's Peter. Peter said, listen, Jesus, I, I've seen you do stuff. I've seen you stuff around me. I've seen you heal people. I seen you turn water into wine. I saw you raise someone from the dead. I saw all these things happening. But God, if this is you, send me. Use me. He's like, are you sure? Because you're going to have to step out on the ocean. It's going to be a storm. And literally, if this doesn't work, you're done. 
I think some of us think that in order to have faith, we have to be 100% sure. I don't think that that's true at all. I really don't think that Peter had full confidence walking on the water. I think he had maybe 51% faith. (laughs) Maybe like just enough to do it. I, I, I don't think that he was like, I'm on it. I think if he was that confident, he would have made it all the way to Jesus. I think that in the process, he had his doubts, he had his thoughts, that as he was walking on the water, he kept processing those, and that's why he, he continued to sink in the storm. If he was fully confident, he'd be like, I'm not tripping, bro. These are wind waves. I'm walking straight to you. That doesn't mean we have to be fully confident. It just means that we've got to take a step. But between all the 18 miracles and this 19th one was the first time that a disciple initiated and said, I'm going to step out. That this miracle that Jesus, you're going to do, is dependent on me walking out. God, I really like the miracles that I see all around me. I like the ones that I've heard about. I like the ones my mom's talked about. The ones that my grandmother has talked about. God, I know that you've done incredible things. But God, use me. God, use me in a mighty way. Put me in a situation where unless you showed up, it's not going to work out at all. That if this doesn't work, I look like an idiot because that's the type of faith that we need. If it's faith that we're walking into, for me to take a step here, boom, boom, boom. That's not faith. For me to walk from here to the podium, I could trust and have confidence. I believe that God has given me breath. I believe that he's given me life. I believe that it's him that I'm here today. I trust that. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is in my own strength, in the muscles of my body, in the logic that I have, I know for a fact that I can make it here to that podium. And none of you would be amazed. Whoop-dee-doo, DJ. Whoop-dee-doo. What is a situation in your life where you've actually stepped out and you said, ah, ah, I might look like an idiot. (laughs) This might turn out really bad, but God, I trust that what you're saying is true. Because I firmly believe that the strength of your faith is dependent on how much you use it. Some of us today are shaking in our faith because we've never taken a faith step. Because if God, if you've never allowed God to use you, then all the evidence you have is everyone else around you and their stories and what they've said. And last week we talked about hope. And the reality is, is that hope is the fuel for faith. That the hope and faith, they work together. But faith communicates what your hope is really in. If your hope is in your money, then you're going to take faith steps with your money. If your hope is in your relationship, you're going to jump out in faith for that relationship. I'm not saying that God's not calling you to do any of those things, but your faith, the way you walk out your life determines what your hope is in. But the reality is I can have hope. Hope is having an exciting uh, exciting perspective on the future of what God's going to do. It helps me wake up. It's my why. It's God, you're going to use me. But faith is saying, God, okay, because of that truth, I want to step out and do something for you. And those things work together. My faith proves my hope, and my hope proves my faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is a confidence in what we hoped for and assurance about what we do not see. That at that moment, he steps out and now has an assurance, you are the Son of God. Faith is the only thing that can prove that the Bible is truly the Word of God. And for you today, you might be struggling in your faith. And my question would be to you, where have you stepped out in faith where if God didn't show up, everything wouldn't work out? Because you're saying, well, really, I've just been really comfortable. I've been having my my 10-step business plan. I've been playing things safe. And 
you know, I make some risks, but it's because that risk I read about in a business book and I felt like it was important, so I did it. What is God telling you to do today? You might lose friends because of it. Something might happen at your job. I don't know what's going to happen, but don't play out logically in your head. Some of us think that faith is the opposite of reason, but I believe that faith goes beyond reason. It's working and operating in the heavenly realm where God calls us to live as sons and daughters of Christ. The Bible says that we are aliens and strangers in this world, which means for, for Peter to walk on water is not an abnormal thing in the kingdom of heaven. That's just another ordinary day. So how are you stretching your faith today? How are you walking out? Because you might be in a storm today, but I can tell you right now that God, in the midst of your fear, in the midst of your worries, is saying, would you come to me? Would you walk out the faith that I've called you to walk out? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Maybe some of you today are struggling in your faith. And faith is not just the idea that I believe. Because I could say that I believe in you. I could say that I believe in crystallized marriage. But faith is really me stepping out and trusting that this is really going to work out because this is God ordained. That it's, there's proof. There's got to be something more than just you saying it. So maybe some of you today are struggling in your faith and you're saying, God, I want you to use me. I've heard what you could do around me and I'm tired of this just being some sort of knowledge in my brain, but I want this to be a reality in my heart that I can know that I know that I know that God, you are really with me. If that's you today on the count of three, can you just lift up your hands? I want to pray with you. I want to include you in my prayer that God would stir something in you on the count of three, one. No one looking around, two and three. Would you just lift up your hand? If you just need a kind of like a power of faith inside that God's going to rise up. I see hands all over this place that God's going to stir something and you can put your hands down. Another group of people is maybe, and maybe you were also raised your hand in the previous group, but you want to commit your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. That the reality of you coming to him, maybe that's what you need to do. You're saying, God, I don't even know you. I, don't, I, I just came to Tuesday night because my friend invited me, but I want to give my life to Jesus. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his life, his only son. That God gave his life. Lord, that uh, God, we thank you today. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That God loves you and he is for you. And maybe today you just want to accept that gift that Jesus loves you. Or maybe you want to rededicate your life. Can you just raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. Can I just see your hand? I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand in the back. Amazing. God's working. He's moving. You can put your hands down. Would everyone just stand up with me just for a moment? We're going to sing this song together. And I really feel like it's prevalent for this time that we're in. That chains would fall. That fear would bow. That we're going to lift high the name of Jesus. That as we face the storms of life, I'm going to fix my eyes on the one who created and allowed that storm to even take place in the first place. Let's sing this together. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your hearts to heaven as we sing this together. Come on. Bow here now. Jesus, you change everything. Lies healed. Hold down here now. Jesus, you change everything. Change.
you're in this room, maybe you're making this decision for the very first time, I'm going to have you repeat this prayer after me. There's nothing special about the prayer, but what I do want to do is lead you in this. The Bible says in Romans that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that, you, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you will be saved. It's as simple as that. Jesus already did the work for you. He said, listen, it's not about rules and regulations. It's about my love for you, and I'm after you today, and he's calling you. So everyone's going to repeat this prayer together so that no one feels alone. But we just say this. Say, dear Jesus, Jesus, I've sinned. sinned. I'm not proud of it, but I admit it. it. Tonight, Jesus, I I lay my sin down. down. Take it, I pray. I I don't want it anymore. And I reach to heaven heaven. to receive your forgiveness, to take the place of my sin. sin. And I ask ask that you would accept me into your wonderful family. family. Tonight, Jesus... I give my life completely to you. I'm yours, Lord. God, we just thank you for every person that's in this room, Lord, that's deciding today, I want you, God, I want you to use me in a mighty and powerful way. God, that as we walk out in faith collectively, as we step into seasons that are unknown, that there might be a lot going on, but God, we're going to walk towards you, that you're going to use us to strengthen our faith and trust in you so we have full confidence that you are with us every moment of every day. It's not a matter of whether or not you are. It's just a matter of whether or not we're fully confident in that. So God, we thank you that you're with us. We thank you that even as we walk through this week, God, that you're never going to leave us. You'll always be close. You'll always have our eye, your eye on us. God, we thank you for your power and your glory. We thank you for this service. And it's your name we pray. And everybody said. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, this is what I want you to do. Maybe you made that commitment for the first time. There's about quite a few hands that were lifted up. We understand that following Jesus is not just a one-time decision. It's a journey. And the reason why we come together is so that you know you're not doing this thing alone. Listen, I love God, and we have a great relationship, but I can guarantee you I can't do this thing without a great community of people around me to help me and stir me up. We recognize that's the need. I know Miami, sometimes it can be hard to find people that love you, that are for you, and we want to let you know that we love you, we're for you. Our one goal for your life is that you walk in your God-given purpose, that God helps you fulfill all the desires of your heart. So listen, if you would, there's a connect card that's on your seat. If you fill that out and bring it to our connect table, maybe this is your, maybe I make the decision for the first time, maybe it's your first time, you're a VIP guest, either way, take that card, bring it to the to the connect tent and if it's your first time we have a gift for you if it's if you're making that decision if you make a decision to follow jesus we just want to resource you with what is your next step now that i've given my life to jesus what does that mean for me we'd love to help you and resource you with that but either way i love you so much once you lift up your hands as i bless you out tonight god i thank you so much for the most wonderful people in the whole wide world the rendezvous at trinity church I pray that you would bless your people when they rise up, when they lie down, when they go out and they come in. Bless them in their labor and in their leisure. Surround them with your Holy Spirit, believing that the rest of this week would be the best of this week. Keep your people safe, healthy, and strong in this season. And it's your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I love you so much. Tuesday for the rendezvous. Have a great night. We love you guys.